The big ball, which we'll see up when we go up, has the planetarium in it and a theater for showing movies oh, on a ball, this huge oh, screen. And what is this sphere from? Like, why they build it? Why they build it? Yeah. Well, they wanted to have a planetarium where they could show the, the sky. Oh, so you can actually go inside here? I'm not going in. No. Okay. You can go. Okay. You can go to the next floor, and I think we'll actually pass it where there's a free show. Okay. But oh, nice. if, if we did that, we'd be sitting there for 30 minutes. So the ball, this great ball, is 87 feet across. Okay. And you can see a couple hundred people on there. Yeah. But I'm more interested in the 87 feet. Okay. Because as we go around this exhibit, and the exhibit is meant to show the scales of the universe. How big is the sun compared to Earth? How big is the Earth compared to Jupiter? And to give you an idea what that is, and they designed this specifically for that. And we were starting right here, where this person is making her YouTube video, <laughs> is the ball represents the visible universe, the okay. whole universe, the whole universe. which is 13.8 billion light years. And it's 87 feet, but it's represented yeah. by that. What I start, what gets me interested and excited about this, I'm thinking of the dinosaurs on the fourth, third floor. I mean, there's plenty of great stuff here. Yeah. I, and I really advise you to see the whole new wall of minerals and gems. Okay which is a 15-minute walk from here. You had to go all the way down around the museum, and that would be the second part of my tour, and I can't do it. This takes too long, long to get yeah. there. And then you're one person. If you have 12 people... Yeah, it's a lot. Keep, yeah, yeah, keep going, keep going. Yeah, yeah. move along. Uh, it's really great, and I would definitely recommend the dinosaurs in that. Okay. But uh, when they open a new wall, it's going to be able to be able right across and go right from here to minerals okay it's very <laughs> so anyway we had this the universe and one of the first things that struck me and very recently in the last five years six years and i come from a very technical background my, my year college was university i have a master's in computer science i have all but a phd in computers and I love that stuff. And all of a sudden I realized I'm really not aware of what my world is like. 500 years ago, if I took equally intelligent people, I said, you know what? We're standing here. Not really, because the earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. And people would start to say, really? And these would be very smart people, but there's, there's no... How do, you, how do you say that? And not only that, the Earth is going around the sun at 20,000 miles an hour. And the sun is going around our galaxy, the Andromeda, Milky Way, at uh, 200,000 miles an hour. And Milky Way is going around the universe at a million miles an hour. So yeah, we're standing here, and we're moving like a million miles an hour, within a million miles an hour. People would be saying, I don't I, you know, really have to crazy to it. Yeah. And yet it is. Same thing as when we look back, and we have a couple of misconceptions. One misconception is people thought the earth was flat. Most people didn't in the last three, 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Civilization in, in the Mediterranean. Oh, the, the, they had the, the ships that were sailing in commerce, and they could see that there was a ship went a mile off shore. It's sort of the mast, it, eventually only the mast was visible. And the only thing that explains that is a curve. So nobody, intelligent, and I define intelligent. When I'm born, when I was born, and I come out, and I'm always just as intelligent as a Neanderthal that was born. But what separates us then is, I now am given information by everybody who's learned. I'm sent to school, I'm shown books, and eventually I'm not quite as ignorant as I used to be. Mm -hmm. And the Anfield didn't have that. So they stayed pretty ignorant, but not dumb. Anyway, so the earth round, no. But then there were other things that were totally intuitive, believable, 
and there was no way I could ever convince anybody. You know, the earth is not the center of everything. Even though we see the stars going around and the moon and the sun, we're not the center. We're circling around the sun. Great thing. How do I prove that to somebody 2,000 years ago? There's no way to do it. I mean, mm-hmm. it and it's, it's not logical. It's counter, counterintuitive. Then you start getting telescopes. And, With cartography. Yeah. And you can see this stuff. And then all of a sudden you find out that, no, we're not the center of the universe. We go around the sun. And then there was a while they thought, well, the sun was the center of the universe. And then as the telescopes got better, they said, no, we just one sun and a bunch of stars. And the astronomers with the telescopes changed the world. All of a sudden, in the 1600s, it changes again. We have mathematicians, specifically Isaac Newton, who he did a little astronomy. Mostly he was a mathematician. Mm-hmm. He invented calculus in order to be able to predict the laws of gravity. And through the laws of gravity, he predicted the motion of all the moons. And, I mean, and moons and planets. Mm-hmm. And so he could show you that just by doing the math, that in, on January, on December 1st at 11.30 at night, if you're in this here, and you're at this latitude and longitude, and you look up exactly there, you'll see the planet moons. And it worked. He was able to predict all the planets very, very accurately. He never, he, he did have a telescope. He invented a new telescope, but for the, he didn't do it that way. He did it by just working the math out. Mm-hmm. This worked fine until the early 20th century when I looked at Mercury, which is closest to the sun. It doesn't, it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit uh, Newton's math. And they were really upset because this is now hundreds of years old. It's over, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And then uh, Albert Einstein came along and he did his theory of relativity and his theories. And he explained that the reason Mercury is not right where it should be is the sun has mass, so huge mass, that it's bending the light. Mm-hmm. So even though Mercury is actually here, the sun makes it look right. And we're talking a very small. Yeah. And that explained it. But again, it was a mathematician, not an astronomer. It, it reached its peak, in my mind, at the other end, when things are very tiny. But you ever hear of CERN, the uh, uh, particle accelerator in Switzerland? Okay. They shoot particles against other particles just to see what would happen. The same as if I would take a rock when I was a kid yeah. and throw it at a pumpkin just to see what would happen. They were doing, they're doing this, and they're still doing this, to see what happens, and they're finding more and more smaller particles. It used to be the atom, then it was these particles that move the atom. About 45 years ago, this gentleman, mathematician, says, if you hit this, this particle fast enough, you'll see this particle break off. But they had no, they had no tools to do that. There's no instrument to do that. But it's not like they became like quarks, like little or exactly. Yeah. But this is even smaller than a quark. Okay. And again, this is, I think it, the clock gets shattered into this. Okay. And it's very, very temporary. Same as the So now, in the early 20, I think 2005 or 2006, in CERN in Switzerland, they have this 20, 20 mile two that they shoot particles around to get them tremendously fast and they hit a target. And for the first time there was enough energy to test his theory and there's a great YouTube video of this, cl- this group of young physicists sitting in a room in Switzerland and they're watching the screen when they do the experiment and there is this particle and they named it the Higgs boson the guy that invented it, that thought it up, that predicted it was Higgs, and they pan over and they're all clapping. He's a very old man sitting there, and he lived the 45 years to see his prediction. So more and more we're seeing the math predicting. We have our universe here, the visible universe, and now the math that they're doing says the only way our 
can exist is if there's an infinite number of universes, not just ours, but an infinite number. I can't get my head around that. But the math is there. There is no way to test it. But that's what they say has to be. Yes. Moving along, and now we'll get what the real aim of this one. This is the Virgo supercluster of galaxies. Each of those black splotches is a galaxy with billions and billions of stars, just like our sun. Okay. And that is the relative size. If that's the universe, that's the size of the Virgo compared to it. And as you move around, and this is bigger. Here we have our local group of galaxies. Here's our Milky Way where we are in our sun. This is Andromeda, the nearest. And now, if this is our local, that now represents the Virgo supercluster. Oh. So we've shifted. Uh -huh. There's a whole mathematical thing here with 10 to the 23, 10 to the 22. Okay. The big ball is now a superstar, a super large star, Rigel. And if that's Rigel, this is our sun. Okay. And scale wow. of Rigel. So, so, uh, so this is nothing. <laughs> You see the difference? Yeah. Now represents the sun. Yeah. The sun. And that's our sun. These are the planets in scale to the sun. So I'm sorry, we're merging together. So you can see there's Mercury, Venus, Mars. I'm sorry, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And so this is Earth. And mm -hmm. that's the sun. That's the size of the Earth compared to the Sun. Yeah. So it gives you the perspective. Hello. What they've done kind of a little bit wrong is for some reason they've raised the mountains and continents off the ball. The reality is the uh, Earth's uh, circumference, uh, the diameter is like 12,000 miles. So the highest mountain on the Earth is seven miles. So if you can pay, if you can compare seven to 12,000, it would never show up like this. Mm -hmm. We're much more like a bowling ball or a billiard ball. Than okay. Like this. Well, the others are, you know, they are. What's interesting is there's, a, in, there's accretion. Gravity brings things together. I mean, as we stand here, gravity it's actually pulling me a little bit that way and this way, mostly this way towards you. Every piece of mass has gravity. And no matter how far you separate it, gravity goes on almost infinite. So if you have an atom over here and another atom a thousand miles away, given enough time to, to they merge. come together. Yeah. And they, when they start gathering, it's called accretion. And that's how the, sun, the stars formed. Hydrogen atoms started come, uh, coming together and coming together and co until they reached such a huge mass that the inner gravity forced them to Tomorrow. raise the heat. We have fusion. But it, for this concept, if there's not enough mass to accrete to a certain level, I think it's a couple of hundred miles, it never becomes a perfect ball. Mad Gravity made Venus that perfect ball in us. If it doesn't have the mass, a place called the Media Crater. And they gave it a clever name, they call it the Media Crater. And it's, I think, 1.2 miles across. And if that's the scale of the Media Crater, now this is actually the Hayden Planetarium. Okay. It is what it is now. Okay. Let's get it. What's cool about this is that it's such a beautiful crater. Yeah. You look at the moon through uh, binoculars or a telescope if you have it, you see all these perfect craters. There's none on it, very few on Earth. <clears throat> the reason why is the weather erodes them away very quickly. We have wind, we have rain, we have ice, we have yeah. snow, frost, defrost. Uh, this will be gone in, say, 50,000 years. And Arizona's pretty dry, but still yeah. even there, it's, it's going to be gone. 
but it's still nice crater. Is media crater, then this is actually the Hayden Planetarium. Oh. <laughs> so it's it's Yeah. Nice. It's right. Well now yeah. if and that's now, the Hayden Planetarium, and this, this is the way, yeah. In scale. This is a red blood cell, a human red blood cell. Wow. <laughs> if that's a human red blood cell, this is a virus. Like this, this. Also, we have a good view, we have a good view here. Oh. This, this circular path is the history of the universe. And as you walk along it, you're gonna have to get very close to see that point. Yeah, this one. Yeah, see the point? Yeah. That was on now is the ball represents a hydrogen atom. Okay. Which is the smallest atom there is. And that dot you the, look at is the nucleus the, well. of the hydrogen atom. And where it starts to get, that dot contains... 99.999999 percent of the mass the mass is the one that died the rest of this is like a hollow the other doing math the other way the rest of the hydrogen atom is point zero 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 one of the mass so it's all there and the, the this was not understood. They all, and up until the beginning of the uh, 1900s, they thought, they, you know, here's the hydrogen atom, and they called it like fig pudding. Here's the, the protein, is the protons, and the nucle nucleus is in that, which is a proton and a neutron, and it's surrounded by electrons. Mm -hmm. The hydrogen is one, but if you go up to uranium is 160. Yeah. But uranium, which is one of the largest atoms, has 160 of those dots, which is still infinitesimally small. So the other way to do it, if you took the hydrogen atom and made it the size of Manhattan, whole island, which is 12 and a half miles from the Battery by the Statue of Liberty up to the Bronx, up almost to the Bronx, mm -hmm. it's uh, that's the hydrogen atom. The size of the nucleus is a basketball. Wow. So yeah, it's, it's just how, and they, they're going in. So they thought this, look, here's the atom, it's kind of a, it's all there, fig pudding, it's all there. And then in the 1890s, they had a new instrument called a particle accelerator, mm -hmm. where they could take a particle like the CERN, but much weaker, and shoot it. And they could hit things with it, just like me throwing a rocket the pumpkin to see what happens. So in a, a laboratory in England, uh, or this, the guy that was director was Ernst, Ruth, Ernst Rutherford. They had a lot of graduate students and they had the, the, the uh, thing set up where the particle center would shoot and they put a target there. They had, usually they like to hit, put like foils, metal foils, tin foils, silver foil, gold foil. And then they would see what happens when the particle hits? Most of the time, nothing happens. And with gold, every once in a rarely they get a, a ricochet. It made no sense. If the, if the atom is like a uniform, why is that happening? And this is the Cavendish lab. So according to the story, Rutherford is sleeping one night or lying in bed, and all of a sudden the answer comes to him. Adam is, uh, Adam is empty and all the mass is in this one tiny little part. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is most of the particles are just shooting through. Every once in a while, very rarely, it hits the basketball um, in New Manhattan and comes bouncing. And um, it came bouncing, sometimes it came bouncing straight back. And they, he equivalent, he said, it's like if a battleship fired one of their big 16 inch guns and it had a, 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 a bullet that was 16 inches in diameter and it hit a handkerchief and came bouncing back. It made no more sense to him than that other than it's hollow. 
And then he imagined, well, what if I get out of bed now and if everything is hollow, why don't I just sink through it? What's keeping me from going through that? And here's the part that I love. And it's a demo, it's fun. I made this myself. Okay. If you take two chopsticks and, just... and magnets, and the, you know the, the horseshoe magnets, this, you know, they're shaped like a horseshoe. Okay. And there's a north pole and a south pole. If you put two of them like this, oh, yeah, they and were you called. put the north and south together, they snap together. Yeah. If, however, you reverse it and try yeah. to put a north to a north and a south, or something, yeah. 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 so I have built this very clever device with the similar poles facing each other. And, and you can I, just... I, I, I will dim it on them, but I want you to try trying to push these like as much as together. you can. Yeah, you try with your good hand. Yeah, it's and the closer you get, the harder it is. Yeah. And which means that all my life, where I thought I was physically touching something, I'm not touching this. I'm but not, not really, yeah. The, the atoms all have an electric, a negative charge on the outside where the electron is. The nucleus is positive, and the, nu the negative charge is on the outside of all these billions and trillions of atoms, so hands are negative, as are the outside of all, whatever I'm touching, this, 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 they're all negative. So I can get closer and closer, and you can't feel it, but you can't feel it, but when you actually get close enough, you are to not feeling... Like the, the real thing. You're yeah. feeling the electronic pushing you away. Yeah. So you, you've never actually touched anything. The likelihood of your atom's nucleus touching that atom's nucleus. Even if it comes like with cinetic, like for example, if you throw a ball, uh, if you throw a ball and you well, catch it. Right. If you follow what you're saying further, yes, if you take a uh, an alpha particle, like I said, and fire it at 100 million miles an hour or whatever the hell the speed is, and you hit the atom, yeah, it'll, it'll go through the electro, electron negative, and it'll hit the atom. Mm. But it's a force that nothing other than those particle accelerators that they had in the Cavendish lab or CERN can do that. A jet plane can't do it, a rocket, a bullet from a gun, none of them can do that. Mm -hmm. What has to be done is, I think the, the speed that the Cavendish had is they accelerated the particle to like, Three or four hundred thousand miles an hour, and then it went, and only then it could penetrate the negative. Now with CERN, they get it up to hundreds of millions of miles an hour, and so the the, the electron and sheet doesn't mean anything to it. Mm -hmm. and they may they make the you know, the mathematicians now make predictions of what the future, like, like Higgs predicted the boson. They're predicting new things at that subatomic level. And the math is right, but there's no, there's no instrument to test it. Yeah. Uh, which gets you down into now quantum math and quantum physics, which can really expand your mind as far as it's not even possible. I look on, on YouTube, which is a source of all information, and there's a great, uh, put in quantum MIT, they have a lot of classes that you can sit in on that they, they've done the whole semester from class day one to the end of the semester with a lecturer teaching the subject. The quantum is only one subject of many. And I found this young guy that was terrific, his enthusiasm. And the first episode, the beginning is the same as it always is. Here's where my office is, this is what the textbook is, here's where the teaching assistant is. And then he starts teaching by showing thought experiments on a blackboard. And I'm sitting there and I'm, oh, yeah. I get that, I get that. And it makes sense and sense and sense. And in the middle of the third episode, he does the thought experiment and he's followed, it's a very logical sequence. And I look at that and I say, no way, that's not even possible. And he pauses to his class and he looks and he says, I'm not making this up. This is true. They've done this in 10,000 laboratories around the world. 
and this is the result. And the result is so not acceptable to my brain. And then, of course, within the next class, he introduced the math that explains it, and the math was also not acceptable to my brain. I had high advanced calculus in college and stuff. I had no idea what he was talking about. But the first three lessons were really terrific. And to see how the world at that small level is so different than we think it is. All the family mammals. The Bernard family of North American mammals. And these are dioramas. And the museum is famous for the dioramas. They have them. This is North American mammals. And for two floors above us, they have African mammals. Yeah. Problem is, they just redid this room about six years ago. It's a whole hundred years old. And the animals were getting very, very faded. So everybody's very perky now. Sadly, they haven't done the African ones in 60, 70 years. Wow. It's still worth seeing. As a matter of right above us is a hall where in the center of the room is a herd of African elephants. Gotta see it, it's really great. But this to me is good as far as seeing the animals. New York City is a very urban area. You know, for some reason, there's not a lot of kids here today. Yeah. They bring in school children. Here. Yeah, I, I saw those those buses. Yeah. And I mean, six million, eight million people come here every year, and a lot of them have never seen an animal other than a squirrel yeah. or a rat. So now they come here. Yeah. Well, I live in. In Aspen, so I, I've seen like many bears like every time, and I went to Yellowstone. And I saw uh, elk. I, I saw elks and especially bisons. It was amazing just to see a bison like almost two feet like far away from me. Yeah, those bisons. <laughs> Basically, I'm talking about New York City children yeah. live in apartment buildings. Yeah, they're kids. like... So I think about how many kids have come through here. And, and this is it. This is yeah. They've seen a moose. They've stood close to a moose. Yeah. Even in Yellowstone, you're not going to get this close to a moose. I, I, I went this close to this um, in Aspen in Maroon Bells. Yeah, it, was, it was like I was in this hill. I just saw it like down, down over there. Oh, no, I'm talking... Uh, Five feet, ten feet. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm not getting that close. Yeah. I mean, I, I was getting that close, and then there was like a woman says like, "Oh, so, like leave, leave, because it's like dangerous." I lived in Florida for ten years, and they have the state park and a swamp, and there's alligators everywhere. Yeah. And the, the park ranger saying, "You have two kinds of people." One kind have been watching nothing but Disney films. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, the happy alligator. Maybe he'll sing a song. <laughs> and the other kind are from like the city who are afraid of everything. He says, mm -hmm. be afraid. And we look over and this guy, he's got his little girl, and he's trying to pose her next to this 10 foot alligator. And the ranger starts screaming, get away. <laughs> anyway, these are the Sidiorama. And the way they did it, is they actually sent a team of people to this specific site in Alaska. Wow. And the artists did sketches and paintings, and they had, they had cameras too. And they recorded it, and scientists collected the dirt and the rocks and the twigs and, and everything and brought it all back. And then they recreated it, and the artists painted the background. This is not a particularly good background, I don't think. But it's difficult to paint and it's curved. It's curved this yeah. way and this way. I can't draw it. But they said it's very hard to do. So they created this. And this particular scene is these two male moose. And they're fighting it out. Oh, to see who's going to mate with nah. the female moose for the summer. They have these great antlers. And they don't, it's not a fight to the death. They're not looking to kill each other. 
basically they're shoving each other around until one gets tired. Like pushing. pushing. Yeah, just pushing and shoving. They do get hurt. I mean, they're pointing. Yeah. Is, but not, where they do die, occasionally they die, is the antlers lock. Oh, oh yeah. And they can't get free, and then they die of starvation. Oh. But very rare. So here they are fighting it out. Uh, and again, being a city boy, there's a lot of stuff I never knew. Whenever I went out to yellow something, and I saw all the furniture made of antlers and doorways with antlers and gates. And I, I said, well, they killed a lot of it. Out, uh, they didn't. They shed their antlers every fall. They just fall off. And you can see them still there. Yeah. Oh, and every spring, the more powerful the male is, the bigger the rat. Oh. When we look at the bisons, they don't have antlers, they have horns. Yeah. You get one set for your entire life. It, you, if it falls off, you never have another one. Yeah. Uh, what else is here? So anyway, apparently they're telling me that when the moose fight it out, the other moose stop and watch. And obviously the young woman stops and watch too. Mm -hmm. But they only made for a year. And the next year, here, Antelope. What's the names? Antelope. Oh, Antelope's here. Yeah. Uh, the picture in the background depicts how many buffalo there I keep saying buffalo, and there's no buffalo. There's bison. They're yeah. all bison. Yeah. The only buffaloes in North America are in zoos. Yeah. The only bisons in the world are in North America and one other place. Yeah. And I can bet you whatever you want, you're not going to get it. It's Poland. Poland. They live in the woods in Poland. Wow. And they're bison. I don't know. So here the bison, and this fear, this depicts when there were 50 million of them out west. And we hunted them almost to extinction. And they do it down to several hundred. And one of the people who saved them was Theodore Roosevelt, who was one of the founders of this museum. He was, a, he was a tremendous hunter, he hunted a lot, but he also was a conservationist. And they showed him, there were 50 million, 35 years ago, it went down to 400. So he established refuges, refuges where they could be unmolested. And so now we have a few million bison. You can now go to many restaurants and get bison steak and bison burgers. Especially in Montana. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So here they are. Uh, they, they get to be like 2,000 pounds. Uh, they've got their horns, they, they won't regrow them again. They're vegetarians. They attract birds like the bird on his back, which is yeah. it's called the cowbird. And the bird eats bugs off its back. I've heard that it, it's like a win win because they're like eating the insects that they have, and they're just like. They, 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 they call it. Technically, it's called symbiosis. A symbiosis, yeah, yeah, symbiosis. One of the things that I, I mean, this is cute, but, I, but you, go, you go into the uh, marine thing, we don't have anything that shows that, I don't think, but on in YouTube, and you see these giant, vicious sharks that go to a reef and open their mouth, and these little fish go in and clean their teeth. Oh. And the shark stays there. With its mouth open, or it's, it's like flossing, and, they, and then when they when they leave, and, uh, mm -hmm. and I said, "Well, that's a that's a great leap of faith yeah. for this little fish, but yeah. symbiosis." So it's here at the bison, and they came back nice. It's a much better picture, I think, than that one. Yeah, and it's they, really clean. They do a very they they sent they have the artist. And really, the people that assemble this thing in one unit are artists. And the way they measure their quality of their work is they look to see where the foreground, and the foreground is the actual dirt and stuff they collected there, merges with the painting. And it's hard to see where the real stuff ends and the painting begins. They give themselves a lot of credit. This one is right. This one is good. Huh? Whenever these will stack up. Uh, 
be the largest mediators in the world, other than the orcas, the killer whales and stuff. But on land, they weigh up to 2,000 pounds, and they're basically carnivores. They're not, they're not big on fruits and berries. Again, the, the diorama. This mud and stuff was all collected in Alaska at the site, and they photographed it and sketched it. So this is as real as they can see. We were talking over 100 years ago. Uh, the, the salmon, it, there's a videos on them redoing this place, and they're holding the salmon, which is balsa wood, and they're just marveling how beautifully it was done that somebody modeled that up also. The mud, the rocks, everything came from there. The background painting. And it is particularly hard for me to see where the real mud and rocks end and the painting begins. They do a really good job. Yeah, it, it, it is a really good job. In the background, you see a river otter. And the river otter is, is upset because it caught the salmon and got to take one bite out of it, and then the bears came. Oh no, wait. Sorry, no, 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 go ahead. This is not for NBC <laughs> News or anything, is it? <laughs> and the bears came and just took the, bear, took the fish. And when you look at the claws, and they weigh 2,000 2, pounds, you could see, and there's, and there's always videos of some jerk goes out there and he's gonna make a friend of the grizzly bears and he lives with them for a month or two. And that, oh, that's the papa bear and this is this and it. And then they eat them. Yeah. And, but they really did a good job here on the mud and stuff. The Sonora Desert in Mexico. And I give so much credit to the background painter. Wow. That he's got the sun rising and the haze. Of the, you know, the early morning haze, he really did it. And jaguars are big cats, and they are the same species as panthers from Africa and leopards, I'm sorry, panthers from India, and leopards from Africa. If you look carefully at a black panther from India, they have spots, but it's continuous spots. Yeah. And, and leopards in Africa, and you can take them and breed them. So you could take a panther from India and a jaguar from Mexico and breed them and get cubs. And the cubs can grow up and then breed. Um, if, if you take a uh, horse and a donkey and breed them together, you'll get a mule. Um, but yeah. you can't do anything. I mean, mules are very yeah. useful. Yeah. You can't do anything. Mules will not. Yeah, will not reproduce. And, yeah. and they will make a species. And if you've ever had a dog, yeah. and the tennis ball has gone under the couch, that is the position for the tennis ball. Mm -hmm. And here it's, it's some kind of an animal. Yeah. Again, the background to the foreground, the stones are actually connected to the merge into the painting in the back. Very hard to see where that is. Yeah. You see their faces. Yeah, it's awesome. And the snow is like mica chips. Also, the teats are really good. Oh, oh really good. Uh, again, YouTube has a great video of when they were redoing this. And you see the curator sitting on the ground and he's spreading the snow like he'd spread salt on a steak like this. And it's mica. But they're so cool. Also, the shadow. Mm -hmm. not, yeah. a sh not a shadow. Yeah, this it's a different color snow. Oh, Same nice. thing with the tree shadows. Yeah. Not a, uh, I just want to thank you, Richard, for everything. Thank you for all the explanation. Thank you for doing it.